While at Star Wars Celebration Anaheim, Roko Depot had the chance to speak with Star Wars author James Luceno. We talked with Jim about his latest Star Wars book, Tarkin, as well as one of his non-Star Wars books, The Hunt for the Mayan Looking Glass. We touched on topics such as travel, villains, and more. All right. Well, thank you for doing an interview with us. Absolutely. All right. Happy well, to be here. I know you like to watch Star Wars Brothers. Uh, what did you think of season one? Oh, I enjoyed it. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, be privy to some of the scripts beforehand and to see those scripts be brought alive uh, and to watch the progression of those characters was just thrilling for me. Uh, you've been on a bad guy kick lately. What did you think of the Inquisitor? I like the Inquisitor. I, I'm sorry I'm not going to get a chance to uh, to write about him. He seems to be right up my alley. And uh, what did you think of Tarkin's appearance on the show? Uh, yeah, I was really looking forward to those episodes because uh, I knew I knew they were coming. And to, I, I always enjoy seeing Tarkin in any venue. I've interviewed you once before for Tarkin, uh, so I covered most of the questions I had on the book already, yeah. but there's a couple of aspects I wanted to touch on. Sure. Uh, one is the hijackers that were in the book. Um, they showed up later in the story, and they weren't quite as well developed as Tarkin or Vader. Um, I was kind of curious, uh, let's see. Kind of a colorful bunch. You had a lot of different species going on there for each different person. Uh, what kind of ideas did you have in mind when you were putting that crew together? Um, I, well, I was trying to avoid uh, having them too too much like your typical band of in, insurgents. Um, I thought if I if I drew from different sources, like had some media personnel and had this. Uh, this this what former spy who had just uh, been totally discouraged by what happened and brought in some of his uh, informants and the people that he worked with that it would be something uh, something new something a little bit different than the than the normal group. Um, and the other question I had was on the carrion spike. Um, there's actually two carrion spikes in the book because you have the right. geographical right. right. And then you also have the ship that gets ship. stolen. Yeah. Um, did that duality of the ideas start in your early planning stages? or? No, actually it didn't. That was uh, just sort of organic to the storytelling. It's one of those um, discoveries you make in the midst of writing. Uh, I, I wanted to... I, I didn't even really have a sense of why the ship was was named the Carrion Spike or what it was in Tarkin's background that gave impetus to a lot of his actions. But in the course of writing, I was probably probably like halfway through the novel and um, and that idea came to me so I ran with it. And was there any ties between uh, the Veer mocks that Tarkin faces when he goes to the geographical carrying spike yeah. versus the hijackers when he goes after the ship? Yeah, I think that, that you can draw a lot of conclusions, uh, even even in the sense uh, there's some analogies to um, the Emperor and even Vader in those scenes with uh, Veer mocks and, and what happens at the carrying spike. Uh, switching gears a bit, I'd like to talk about something outside of Star Wars. Uh, the hunt for the Mayan looking glass. <laughs> I haven't heard that mentioned before. You're the first to bring that up. It's a very immersive story. I appreciate uh, that. And it's a very a unique fantasy story. Um, how did you manage to become familiar enough with the Mayan culture in that setting to be able to write a story? Uh, I've been traveling uh, to Mayan archaeological sites uh, since probably uh, 1969, when I was, you know, I was like 18 years old when I went down to Mexico for the first time. Uh, visited a Maya site and it just had that culture imprinted on me and in the intervening years I've probably visited uh, 100 archaeological sites down there uh, in some cases I've uh, I've walked for two weeks to reach them you know with a mule train and, and full expeditionary kind of gear um, so I've, I've just they've just long fascinated me and um, in speaking with uh, archaeologists and anthropologists through the years, I was able to really get a sense of what that culture may have been like. In researching them, is there any fun things you discovered about them? 
Uh, now, ju- the thing that really fascinates me about the Maya and really distinguishes them from other uh, cultures, pr- particularly Stone Age cultures, is um, their absolute obsession with the heavens and um, their minute study of heaven, the motion of heavenly bodies. They, they plotted um, the orbits of, of Venus and Mercury. They were so well aware of the night sky and based so many of their rituals around the movements of stars and planets that they are really different than any other culture on Earth. Uh, recently, you did an interview with John Morton for Jedi News. I did. Where you guys talked about your travelers. That's true. Travels. Yeah. And I know you're traveling a lot. Yeah. And you've mentioned once before that you had done uh, sort of a memoir of some of your travels with Brian Daly. That's true. Uh, do you still have any plans to maybe release that someday? Yeah, I think um, I do plan to. to re- I, it could be that its moment has passed because a lot of it was sort of set when. Um, I'll tell you what the story was. Um, uh, shortly after Brian. Brian died. Um, I uh, I took his ashes to an archaeological site that we had tr- attempted to reach on several occasions, and uh, the memoir is really about what was my successful uh, attempt, my, my successful uh, reaching of that ruin and disposing of some of Brian's ashes there. And I think that um, I will go back to that and probably put it online at some point. I'd like to. Yeah. Um, here at Celebration, you're doing a panel on whether writing villains is hazardous for your health. Yes. Uh, do, you, do you think writing villains has affected you as a writer? Uh, you know, it's it's uh, that's pr- really going to be the subject of my uh, of my talk in the workshop. Uh, I think that I had to get past the notion of um, accountability uh, in in creating villains that are. Uh, what I what I would say is the heroes of their own story was I really orchestrating these stories to make people uh, admire evil, and that, and I had to get past that in order to really get comfortable with the notion of exploring evil in a fictional way. Now, with uh, writing so many villains lately, is that because you like doing that, or is it just changing gears? Um. That's a tricky one. I, I think it's I, I think it's a little of both. I mean, I, I had the fortune of writing about uh, Han and Luke in, in the early days in the New Jedi Order, so it was interesting to write about heroes, the good guys. Um, I think as a writer, it's interesting to be on the other side and to be able to devote as much attention to the bad guys. Lastly, what are some essential characteristics for a good villain? Well... This is something I'm, I'm still grappling with, uh, and I've, I've really made like a study of uh, villains in literature. Um, I, and uh, I think that what I've understood is that a villain has to be as even more fleshed out than a hero. Um, in fact, I came across this, this quote by C.S. Lewis who said that a villain is easier to write because... Uh, even the best of us can't imagine what it's like to be heroic, even on our best days, to, to perform acts of heroism. But to write a villain, all you need to do is dig down deeply into your baser instincts and let those surface on the page, <laughs> and you've got your villain. All right. Thanks, Jim. Cheers. Thank you for listening to our interview with James Luceno. If you'd like to hear more Star Wars interviews or check out some of our reviews and Star Wars coverage, please visit rocodepot.com. <laughs>